Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Reader's Digest Book Club. I am your host, Tracy Nethercott, and I am here today and so excited to be joined by Michelle Hoffman. She is the author of The Second Ending, which is the Reader's Digest July pick, and I love this book. So, Michelle, thank you so much for joining us. I cannot wait to talk to you about it. Um, I have to say, this book, I flew through it. Um, I am not musical at all. So um, I was so surprised by how much I love it. So we have a ton of questions for you from members. I'm going to save those till a little bit later on. First, I just want to talk about the book. Um, and so for starters, you know, for anyone who hasn't read it yet or hasn't finished it yet, can you tell us a little bit about the plot, what they can expect if they pick up the book? Yeah. So um, this is about a former piano prodigy who has a midlife crisis. Um, so she, at three years old, her talent was discovered and uh, she was living with her grandmother and she kind of had that same trajectory as a lot of child stars. It's too much too soon. And uh, she, her grandmother stole all her money. <laughs> and by the time she became 18, she didn't want to do it anymore. She ran away from home. She got into Juilliard and started writing commercial jingles and, and made a lot of money doing that. Um, so she was pretty successful. No more performing, no classical music. And when she turns 48, she has her midlife crisis. And she kind of wants to find out if she really is a true artist or if she was just a fraud all along. So... Um, she competes on a reality uh, television show, an American Idol type competition show. And she challenges, it's a dual dueling piano <laughs> format. And she challenges the 22 year old Russian pianist who is the host. And she, uh, she wants to see if she's, she really had the chops in the first place. Whoa. So I know that you play piano from a very young age. Is that sort of where the idea came from? Or I guess, what was that first uh, thing that came to you? The, was it the piano players? Was it the midlife crisis? Um, what aspect of the book just sort of like got you first? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it, it the, the first thing that came to me was um, my kids were going off to college. <laughs> and um, I was kind of fascinated with this idea of a midlife crisis could have a really positive effect mm -hmm. that um, that discomfort we feel that pushes us to kind of fulfill our potential self actualize. Mm -hmm. and, and I was really fascinated with that, this whole concept of self actualization. I think when we become, you know, adults and later in life, we abandon uh, the dreams of our youth. Mm -hmm. We think it's too late. And I don't think it is. Um, and I wanted to, and I thought music was a perfect medium to tell the story and, and a middle-aged housewife um, that, you know, readers could identify with. Uh, and we're all fascinated with music. We like music mm -hmm. and um, music is something that I know. And I thought it was a perfect medium to tell a story. And, and I wanted the character to have, um, a lot of doubt and insecurities because, you know, and here's somebody who's immensely talented. Um, and if she has those doubts about herself, then we can all sort of, you know, identify with it and, mm -hmm. and follow her and how she um, gets through that. Yeah. I love that aspect. I, I was telling you earlier that I um, do not play any music. I know nothing about music. I'm, probably the least musically inclined person you'll ever meet. Um, but it was so relatable for that reason that you're talking about, you know, whether, and I'm, I'm also curious if this sort of played into not only your experience with music, but also with writing, because I felt like as a writer, I really identified with both her and Alexi, um, the pianist who she's competing against. Um, because, you know, there is that struggle and doubt and fears and, and sort of getting over that hurdle. So um, did you really draw from like your music experience or was the process of writing the book sort of helping you experience some of those things Prudence and Alexia are going through? 
Yeah, it was more um, writing the book and, um, you know, uh, the music aspect of it. I do play every day. I still play, um, but I'm not performing or competing or um, it's, it's very piano is very enjoyable for me. Um, I love to just go into a music store. It's like a bookstore to me and just just buy, you know, a sack full of sheet music. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something, it's very enjoyable to me. I think when we're young, when I was younger, it was a little bit harder because you had to be very disciplined to learn the, to learn mm -hmm. how to play. You had to know your scales, you had to practice. Um, but the the struggles in the book, I think were related to to writing and, mm -hmm. and really wanting this and having this goal. Um, and, and also learning how to enjoy the process. So, I, you know, it can be very frustrating with writing. Um, plotting is difficult. Sometimes something doesn't work and it's like, oh, do I even have a book here? You know, and, but you have to trust the process and, and problem solve. And um, I started to really enjoy that. I enjoyed the characters coming to me. Um, some of them just kind of fell out of the sky. <laughs> like you. Uh, Holden. Um, so we won't talk too much about it, but yeah, Holden is a little boy in the book. And um, he, I thought, wouldn't it be funny if this little kid interrupted Alexei, you know, and, and then it's the whole idea of this little boy being drawn to the music. Mm -hmm. I mean, kids love the piano and, and everybody does. If somebody is sitting down playing the piano, it's like an instant draw. Mm -hmm. Um so, but Holden just kind of fell out of the sky for me. Um, you know, Tamara Quigley, she kind of just popped into my mind as the antagonist. So, yeah, so I, I really learned to enjoy the process of writing, but it, the book is more about the struggles with actually writing a book and yeah. not so the musical aspect. Well, and it, it, I guess there must be overlap there because with, with writing and creating music, because there is all of that, you know, um, I want to be creative, but am I doing it right? Or am I, you know, uh, too disciplined, not disciplined enough, um, you know, tapping into creativity while also being incredibly disciplined like um, Alexi was. Just all of that really, I mean, it came through the, and as someone who doesn't, can't, uh, necessarily relate to the creation of music, I still found this such a relatable book in so many other ways, just the, the character elements. Um, and I do want to touch on the characters because you mentioned a few of them. And I'm curious how you came about or how you came to write this the way you did, because um, this is told from a lot of characters' points of view, not just Prudence and Alexi, although those are the primary protagonists. What made you do tell the story that way? Um, is sort of this omniscient uh, narrator versus just through Prudence's eyes or just through Prudence and Alexi's points of view? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, um, I when I first started writing the book, I had it in first person, and it was horrible. It just didn't work. <laughs> you can't you and you know, you need, you need distance from prudence. And, and then there's, you can make her a little more eccentric. Um, and it's fun to just watch what she does. The omniscient point of view came in because we're all the characters are dealing with a struggle and, um, you know, each one has a dream. And so, I wanted to observe, I wanted the reader to be able to observe all these different characters, not be in one person's head to, and to see all their little different journeys, how they, um, you know, how they get to the end, how they handle it, how they handle the people in their lives who try to stop them. Um, you know, Jesse O'Neill, the HOA kid. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I thought he needed to be in there because I think young people in college wonder why they're there. Is it worth all this money? I don't know if I have any direction here. So the omniscient point of view allowed me to have all these different journeys. Uh, you can observe all the different journeys. And, and I think a lot of people can relate to a lot of the 
different characters through that. So that's how that seems to be. Well, and you kind of make a point that like this theme of getting second chances or a second chance at your dreams really is universal. It's not just at midlife or when you're in college. I mean, you had a lot of different ages there um, to sort of show that same thing, which I really liked. And I liked your point about sort of giving yourself some distance from prudence, because at times it does feel like the narrator is kind of, you know, not outright, but in a way speaking to the reader, like, this is what Prudence did. Can you, you know, sort of a humorous look at her or realizing this woman is, is being a little bananas right now. So, um, very dramatic Prudence. Yes. Yes. Um, so it's very nice to, <laughs> and it was a nice, she's a nice, uh, contrast to Alexi who is, you know, completely the opposite. Um, which is that, is that sort of why you crafted that character that way? Yes. Um, initially when I first started writing it, I had pictured Alexei as the antagonist. Mm. And then when I started, you know, writing, I felt sorry for him. And I was like, no, he's got his own stuff going on. But, uh, Prudence and Alexei was sort of this nature versus nurture. Mm -hmm. And so Prudence was just kind of born with the music in her and Alexei was very uh, nurtured into it and had to work very hard. And um, so, yeah, it was that was sort of like two different ways to approach learning music, which I think you can learn them both ways. You know, I think everybody has a little bit of music in them and that can be nurtured. Even you, Tracy. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't say that if you heard me play the piano. But, um, <laughs> no. um, so was there a character who you, and not just of those two, but any character who you really related to the most or, or felt like, you know, this is me coming through the most? Maybe Stuart. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not, you know, I, I Prudence, Prudence was a fun character. I, I wish I could be more like Prudence, you mm-hmm. know, kind of uninhibited in that way and just, uh, you know, kind of sassy. I think I'm more, I think Stuart is is more, I'm a little bit more introverted and, you know, on the supportive end and um, a little quieter than, than Prudence. <laughs> yeah. Aren't we all? I mean, she's great for that reason. Is, it, is she who you lean to in terms of like, um, having fun writing them. Cause I felt like while I was reading it, I was like, she had a lot of fun writing this. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, Prudence just took off, um, after the first chapter. And, um, I thought it, you know, is, wouldn't it be funny if she just wore her pajamas all day with all her jewelry and, you know, could pull it off, like wasn't self-conscious about that at all. Um, yeah, I loved building her. I loved, um, how she just is over dramatic about these things. You know, she has this fight with Stuart and it's like, it's extreme her whole, and, you know, I think the mind of a genius and massively talented person, just that goes all over the place. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was a lot of fun writing about that. Yeah. Yeah. I also want to discuss how you wrote the music in the book, because obviously that is a huge part of this. Um, But I felt like, you know, it didn't bog down the narrative to the point where I'm like, I don't know what she's talking about or anything like that. If you are not someone who understands music, you can read this book and completely enjoy it. So how did you, um, you know, sort of write about not only the act of creating music and loving music in that, but also the pieces that they're playing, which I feel like must have been so hard to get across, you know, what you're hearing in your head to make us hear something similar in ours. Yeah, I was, that was when I started writing the book and I, and I knew I wanted it to be about piano music. And I think classical music is not something that excites people. I mean, we're taught to respect it. And um, I really think that if you sat down and listened to some of the music, I have, I have this belief that it, I think it, it's just, it's really beautiful stuff. 
and it still holds up today. So when I was, so I was, I wanted to be careful about that. I wanted to be careful about shoving it in the reader's face. Um, so I would take a notebook, a pad of paper and a pen, and I would go to my piano and I would play like the Rachmaninoff piece. And that, that piece can really tap into a memory for me. Not, not, a, not a specific one that, um, you know, the first time I heard it, I don't know, but it just, there is something about that song that makes me think of my backyard when I was a kid. So I would have the pad of paper and I would write down, uh, I'd play it, I'd play some of it. And then I would write down, is this tapping into it? What emotion is this tapping into? Mm -hmm. How am I feeling right now? What does it sound like to me? Um, is it, is there a memory that I'm thinking of right now? And I did that with all the pieces. Um, and then I had to make, I, I felt like it was really important to make the descriptions concrete without using musical terms. Um, like uh, there's a sentence in there that said the chords sound like clock chimes mm -hmm. and that the reader can, can hear that, you know, yeah. it's very concrete for them. So I hope I did my job right because I would love it if um, readers explored the music in the novel. It's, it's all really beautiful um, and a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, I know we had someone who mentioned, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. We had someone who mentioned that during the reading process, she would open up YouTube and listen to those songs when it was, you know, mentioned in the book to sort of get that experience, which I thought was such a good idea. And I, I wish I had done the same because, you know, just having that extra layer, um, I think it would just be, it would be so cool, especially if you don't know some of these Um off the top of your head, it does. It makes you curious what it sounds like and, you know, can I go play it? So um, I, lo I love that aspect of it, especially as someone who is mostly coming to it blank. Um, I'm curious, though, uh, you know, is there something about music that you want readers to take away from it, whether it's, you know, about music in general or classical music or piano music in particular? Um, it it for as far as classical music goes, um, I, and part of the humor in the book was I didn't want I didn't want it to take itself too too seriously. Um, I want people, I want readers to not feel intimidated by the music, um, because I don't think the composers would have wanted that. I think they want everybody to listen to their music and. Um, so it, I didn't want to describe any of it in a way that was uh, intimidating. Um, also, I think all of us are musical in a way that we like to listen to it. We like to sing, we like to dance, whether it's you know classical or pop music or being in the club. I mean, it just feels good. So um, yeah, that's, I, did I answer the question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Where am I going? <laughs> no, that makes sense. So did you listen to, I know some writers listen to music, some writers miraculously listen to music with words while they're writing, but what were you listening to while you were actually doing the actual writing? I am one of those writers that um, I can't, I, it has to be completely quiet for me when mm -hmm. I'm writing, but every evening after dinner, just cleaning up the kitchen where every single evening I put in my headphones and I'd listen, I get my Spotify list going and um, I would listen to music and get ideas about what songs should be in there, um, mm -hmm. what songs should head the chapter. So all the chapter headings are, are different songs and it's not classical music. A lot of it's like jazz, pop music, because music is music and, and even pop music is based off of classical music. You know, a, a lot of people use Bach, um, it, you know, and it just, it's all, we're all in the same family here. So um, I did listen to a lot of music, not writing. Yeah, that, no, that makes sense. Um, 
I want to transition to the humor in the book because this was a really funny book. That aspect of, or how funny it was or how funny I found it uh, was a surprise to me. So what role did you see humor playing? Because they, they go through, you know, the characters go through some serious situations or they're dealing with a lot of upheaval. Um, but yet, especially with Prudence, there are these situations and scenes where it's really funny. So um, did you put that in specifically to like, you know, lighten the mood or, or, or say something in particular? Um, or what role did you see that playing? Um, yeah, the, ex I, I kind of felt like we all needed a laugh. Initially, <laughs> the book was going to be dark with no humor. And then, you know, we got in the middle of the pandemic and um, or the pandemic started and it just I I I think readers needed a laugh. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I wanted it to be lighthearted, a bit whimsical, um, definitely funny and also to take make classical music not so serious. And uh, yeah, so definitely that's how, you know, I really felt strongly about making it a funny book. Yeah. Well, mission accomplished. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I have some other questions for you, but I'm going to hop really quick to read our questions because I want to make sure I get through those. Um, you touched on your experience a little bit, but a lot of people were really interested in your experience as a pianist. So uh, you mentioned that you haven't played for competition, but have you played for a large audience? And did your experience as a pianist help shape the characters? I definitely think my experience definitely helped shape the character. There's a lot of discipline. Um, and it's not when I and other piano players will will know this. It's not you don't sit at the piano and just play this beautiful song. It is really work. Um, and it's, it's, it's not always fun. It, you're, you're rehearsing a measure, one measure, um, which is about four notes, or however many notes are in there, but it's over and over and over and over and over and over again. Um, you're starting out with scales, you have to know your scales. Um, so it's, it's definitely disciplined. I am not a performer. I just, it, it, I remember being in college and um, one of my professors wanted me to play before a panel. And I just said, I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> I'm shy. And she was great. She was like, keep playing, um, you know, play for yourself. Uh, but I was not a stage performer. And if, so, if people are around and they want to hear a song, absolutely I'll play. But I'm definitely not a performer. I don't like to compete. I just, you know, I still play every day and I like to learn new songs. And there's just something about being able to create music with your fingers, you know, that's, mm -hmm. um, and I have to allow myself sometimes to not do the scales. I, my, Sunday morning is my time where I can just play what I want. I, I play anything beautiful, play pop music, play anything, because you have to enjoy what you're doing. I kind of get a little bit caught up in you know, <laughs> where that measure is perfect. So. <laughs> so no dueling pianos uh, reality show for you. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> That'd be a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. If only there, I would actually watch the show. As I was reading this, I was like, you know what? I think I would watch that. Um, especially if we got their backstory. Um, yeah. So you started playing the piano at age five and kept playing. Was it easy to keep being that dedicated as you went through the years? Um, actually, it's easier now. Um, you know, you're it, putting a child in piano and you know the all the discipline it calls for there were times when i definitely was like i want to grow my fingernails out like the other girls in seventh grade mm -hmm. <laughs> it was back then that was a big no-no on the piano so but then i did get to a point where i i knew it was something that um i did i shouldn't let go of it um and and to keep to keep it always in me because there are a lot of people, you know, I'll sit down and play a song and someone will say, oh, I wish I'd never quit my piano lessons. I mean, constantly. Mm -hmm. And um, 
so now I am much more disciplined. I play hand and exercises each morning. I play my scales every morning. I push myself to sight read. I, um, you know, I'm learning a new song right now. And yeah, I, I'm a little bit more disciplined. And before the pandemic, I thought about just, you know, having a few piano lessons, just, you know, that's always good to go back and get some instruction. And so, so, so right now, is it more like you're, you're just maintaining your skill and so you don't lose it, not with the intention of I'm, I'm going to go, you know? Yeah, no. Concert it's just, yeah, it's just, and mentally learning new pieces is, is, you know, I guess cognitively mm -hmm. it's, it's good for me, but yeah, I, I just like to play. Yeah. And, um, I, I, I can suffer from a bit of stage fright sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> That's understandable. But hey, I, if you have the skill, yes, <laughs> keep it. <laughs> because that is a tough skill. Um, so our members are asking who your favorite composers are. So I'm hoping that you can um, say some of your favorites and, and people that we should be Googling after this to go listen to. Um. Ah, uh, there's so many. So Eric Satie, uh, I, I, you know, I just love, um, love his stuff. Um, Debussy is probably one of my favorite. Chopin, Chopin has really beautiful music. Um, I love Beethoven, you know, um, Mozart is brilliant. It's probably not my go-to, you know, I have a few pieces that I play. Um, but I highly respect him as, I mean, he just, you know, just a genius. Um, and I, I'm a huge Rachmaninoff fan, Rachmaninoff. And he's a little bit more contemporary, a little bit later than the others. And so it's, it probably, I would, I would start exploring Rachmaninoff a little bit. This is a similar question, but with a twist, is if um, someone wanted to develop appreciation of listening to classical music, what pieces would they start with um, beyond just like those composers? Are there, are there certain pieces? Um, I don't know if it would be pieces as much as the era of the music. So you mm -hmm. have classical period, you have Baroque, you have classical, you have the Romantic era, which the, the Romantics are great. Um, I would look into that to build because as technology changes, the music changes. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have a piano until, uh, I can't remember. I think, uh, Beethoven was kind of on that. One of the first ones to compose on an actual piano. I, I don't quote me on that. Um, Mozart did not. So Mozart's music doesn't have a lot of pedal work. Um, so that, that's, I would go through era. And um, I think people are drawn to the romantics the most. Um, contemporary at 19th century um, or 20th century, you know, I, they'll probably, like Chopin, yeah. Uh, gosh, I was caught off guard with that question. <laughs> well, you surprised me in saying that it's more of the era. Um, so yeah, that's fascinating. This is, this is, hopefully catching you less off guard, which is saying um, your characters are quirky and fun, which is why the plot seemed plausible. Was it difficult to achieve that balance? Parenthetically, I loved the way you described the performances and the way performers feel about their art. Mm. Um, yeah, the quirkiness, um, it was, you know, you, I had to carry that through the novel. And I, mm -hmm. the way I did that was to really get to know the characters um, and predict what they would do and, and to keep it, to keep it kind of light and, uh, not light. I mean, there's some dark things that happen and I wanted to shed light on their interior and, um, have them struggle and have it really organic, their struggles be really organic and then keep the humor. In. Yeah. It was a little bit of a balancing act. Mm -hmm little bit of rereading the day's pages from before and um and making sure that that it it works you know it's a lot of rereading and rewriting and mm -hmm. editing. 
I forget what the last part of the question was. Oh, that was just a comment saying uh, this, this person said, parenthetically, I love the way you describe the performances and the way the performers feel about their art, which I agree with. <laughs> yeah. That was really, really great. Thank you. Um, this, this, I think, is talking mostly about uh, Prudence and Alexei. Um, there seems like a lot of parental dysfunction in the book. Can you comment on that? Is it common for pianists to have great passion to perform and then need to step away? Um, so, so anytime a child, I mean, I, I really loved, uh, I was in a, a, I've started out maybe at four in something called Yamaha, which is built for little kids and, you know, made music fun. And, um, you know, we had all these little, toys and things and we sang when we played um but i think in the situation i wrote about you're putting children in a situation where um their success depends on you making them do these things and it, it, there is a lot of discipline now i took i took a little liberty with that in the book for the idea of tension but i do think like like musicians when they start out so young your parents are pushing you a lot. Prudence is an extreme case. She was mm -hmm. a child star. And um, and, and then Alexei's parents, I think it was, it was a means of survival for them to get out of Russia. So there was a lot of pressure on him to do that, uh, to, to, to be uh, extraordinary. And anytime you're putting somebody young into being extraordinary, I think there's a lot of a lot of dysfunction that happens. Yeah, it felt very similar to some real life stories you hear about very young child performers, whether, you know, musicians or Disney Channel actors, you know, like that, that sort of like pressure coming from parents and suddenly, you know, you hit adulthood and you were not the, the amazing phenom that they thought you were. Uh, I, can, I think it can work. I mean, I think it oftentimes it does. I just feel like, uh, so in the book, you know, I had to put it that way, but I do feel like some piano teachers are very sensitive to that and parents and they want to make it, there's got to be some enjoyment in it. Yeah. Um, but years ago when everybody had piano lessons, you could get some pretty, uh, some pretty strict, situations <laughs> yes i remember friends having to go to piano lessons and it was always like ah oh, i gotta go to piano today <laughs> it, was, it was always that like chore um but you know like you said you look back in adulthood and you're like oh well how come i didn't get to go to piano <laughs> um so always, always different perspectives um so another question is whether you think bobby is actually a hero Bobby, um, I think Bobby wants to be the hero. And um, I, I think he hasn't really done the work yet to face his all his uh, stuff going on in his life. So he sort of bypasses doing all the hard work. Um, but I think his he does have some true intentions of wanting to 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 be this hero. He just he just doesn't have the uh, the stuff yet. And he he and he's he will probably never have, you know, what it takes to be in that position. What he sees in his mind as a, you know, yeah, Bobby, uh, version. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he was kind of a fun character to write. <laughs> He's a little yeah. goofy. <laughs> I have to say, so another fun character was Tamara, 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 yeah. uh, Tamara. And, uh, Someone here asked, why weren't there any consequences for her? I know that you set her up to be the antagonist. She's probably the only character who we, you know, actively dislike purposefully in the book um, because she's just that super annoying. Like you could put a face to someone you've met before yeah. and Tamara quickly. Like, um, so, so do you feel like there were any consequences for her? And if not, why? If so, what were they? I feel like uh, Tamara, it, she she gets in her own way. So mm -hmm. she kind of, you know, she's not going to win. And that's kind of the consequence for her. I, she just, 
struggles and she she keeps going down the same path and this this you know animosity towards prudence is bringing her down and holding her there mm -hmm. and i think that is the consequence it's it's so much about her and not taking responsibility for how she feels so mm -hmm. she just kind of lashes out and blames prudence for everything so i kind of wanted to, to not be like oh justice is served for tomorrow because i think tomorrow was her own worst enemy in that at that point she sort of let that envy get the better of her too um meanwhile prudence is like i i you don't even register for me, <laughs> um, which is a, a good way to be. Um, someone else asked, why did Prudence let Jesse get arrested after he told her why he did it or why he did what he did? Um, well, she already called the cops, I think. The police were on the mm -hmm. way. And um, so I it just it, I wanted Jesse to have his consequence. Um mm -hmm and have his, you know, epiphany. And she, but she kind of helps him. And yeah. yeah, I just, I guess I just, she already called the cops and I didn't want it to dissolve into a scene where she says, oh no, everything's fine. I thought it'd be more interesting if uh, Je Jesse actually had to, you know, Go Deal with his actions, yeah. <laughs> what he did. Um, I loved her handling of that too. It was very prudent, um, but it was also unexpected. And um, I love that scene. And I should have asked this one before when we were talking about Tamara, but someone else asked, you mentioned that she is a justice warrior, or at least she thinks she is. Interesting term. How would you define that? Um, that there are people and we all know these people that their view of things well that's not fair it's not fair and uh, she is constantly you know looking at situations that that she herself creates and saying that's not fair mm -hmm. um and she's preoccupied with other people and she she doesn't look at herself and um, I think people who are caught up in what's fair and what's not fair are not looking inward. They're, they're mm -hmm. pushing it outward. So yeah, Tamara is a justice warrior. Things have to be fair. She's very her world. Um, she needs to control it. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's where I got that justice warrior. She needs to control it and she cannot <laughs> because it yeah. is the world. <laughs> right. Um, and hence her uh, heading the HOA, which is, I guess, if you're going to try to control everything, there you go. Yeah. Perfect role for you. Mm -hmm. um, so we sort of talked about this offline before, but I know we're discussing your book tonight. Are you near a piano so we can listen to you play a piece? I know you're not, <laughs> um, but can you tell us where we may be able to see you play something or see an example of something you've played? Um, you know, there. so there's just a tiny clip of me on Instagram playing the theme from Amelie. Um, and I, I haven't, you know, posted anything online and maybe I'll work on that. Um, and I was, I was visiting a friend in Atlanta and they had this beautiful Steinway and I was there for a book signing and my husband came with me and we were packing up and he goes, are you really bringing your piano music on this trip? <laughs> I said, yes, we're staying in a house with the Steinway. I have to play it. Um, so there's just a little clip of that. Um, but that's probably the only place I'll try to put something, uh, online at some point on Instagram and still, I'm still learning Instagram. So, uh, I'm still learning how to post videos and I, I have to employ my kids <laughs> <laughs> very frequently. So we will look out for that. Um, before we close, I just want to ask you some book recommendations. Um, I know you, uh, gave us some, uh, music recommendations, but I am curious, um, what are some books you've read recently and loved or some of your favorite books that you think uh, really belong on our TBR list? Um, I uh, really loved Emma Klein's The Guest. I think she is an incredibly talented writer. And um, she 
just can write a really creepy book. And she's, she did that with the girls. She wrote the girls. So, uh, and it's a, it's a quick book and um, I couldn't put it down. So I really liked her. Um, I love Anthony Doerr. I mean, you guys have probably done uh, Cloud Cuckoo Land, um, All the Light We Cannot See. I will read anything he writes. I just think he is so exquisite. Um, right now I'm reading Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver, and I, I love it. I The voice, everything works. It's just and I don't want to read it too fast. So one of, that's one of the books that, a kind of book that I can just fly through it and mm -hmm. I want to savor it a little bit. Um, I'm reading Trust right now. Um, Herman, uh, is it Herman Diaz? Trust. Mm -hmm. yes. So um, that one, I don't know if, you know, that's got a funky format, but, um, and I just, I'm looking at my shelf. <laughs> Uh, I've got All Night Pharmacy and Hello Beautiful. I'm looking forward to reading those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So many good books. Lots of good ones. Yes, I know we've had people mention they loved like uh, All the Light We Cannot See and Demon Copperhead, um, which is also on I'm on reserve at the library and waiting for that. Uh, you will not be disappointed. I, I know. I'm sort of like, oh, maybe I should just get it because like you said, it's, it, you know, one you want to savor and, and sort of not rush through in I think 22 days that you <laughs> that you get at the library but um that's awesome that's all you know lots of stuff for us to add to our our wish lists um and then finally what are you working on now I mean can you say anything about what your what your next book is or what you're writing I am working on my next book and it is I can't say too much about it yet um, we're still kind of going over some things, but it is a high concept novel and it's a strong female character and it's not Prudence 2.0, <laughs> but it is going to be a, a strong female character. There's going to be humor in it. Um, she's very self-aware and, um, yeah, I hope, you know, I hope I can write it. <laughs> I am working on something else. And that's the tough part. Yeah. So explain just for uh, all of our members, explain a little bit um, if you if you can quickly just say what high concept is, because I think um, I, I don't know if that's a familiar term for everyone. And I know you probably can't give an example with your own book by what you mean. But um, high concept is you can explain it you can explain the whole plot in one sentence. So there's some extraordinary things about it that you, you see the hook and you see, you know, it's just, you can explain it in one sentence. Um, so for instance, the second ending, you have a form of child prodigy. Well, child prodigies are inherently, you know, uh, you know, fascinating. So um, that was kind of what made it high concept. And competition and yeah. So as opposed to like, you know, um, some literary fiction, that's, mm -hmm. that's more of the character and, and developing, it's not a lot of high action. So high concept has a little bit more action. Awesome. Well, tell us where we can find you um, online on social media, especially if we want to watch out for any upcoming uh, music in your videos. Um, where can we find you? Um, so you can on Twitter, you can find me at Michelle, M I capital M I C H E L L E capital H F F M N. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. And then Instagram, it's michelle.hoffman underscore, all lowercase. And yeah, that that, you know. <laughs> so. yeah. oh, is it? It's, yeah. So it? if, if anyone wants to uh, find her, check out the ticker below. Those social media handles are the best way. Um, awesome. And yeah. again, this has been uh, the second ending. It is a fantastic book. Um, definitely recommend getting it, picking it up. And it is one that I know I will be rereading in the future. Uh, I know some of our members are already talking about rereading. It's just such a fantastic book. And I am so yeah. glad to hear how it came about and what inspired you and everything. It's just, I love, I love hearing the behind the scenes of the book. So um, thank, you. thank you so much for joining us and, and you know, answering all of our questions. 
I was delighted to be here. Thank you for having me, Tracy. This was a lot of fun. Thanks so much. And everyone, thank you for tuning in and stay tuned uh, next month when we are going to be reading Return to Valetto and happy reading. <laughs>